Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is an interesting new series on the Psalms, talking, of course, about the Psalms in the Bible. And this is lesson number two in that series for January 13 of 2024, entitled, Teach Us to Pray. That might be a clue about which, which of the Psalms they're going to be talking about this, this week, huh? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, help us to be honest in our prayers. Help us to be truthful in our prayers. Help us to understand what these people from so many years ago learned about how to pray and how to represent you correctly in their prayers. May we come to be more like you with our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, is it acceptable to have learned prayers? Here's another whole aspect of the th story. Like the Psalms or the Lord's Prayer? Is it all right to, prayer, to pray learned prayers? Jim? From the Bible Study Guide. A brief, excuse me, belief. a belief that only spontaneous, unlearned prayer is real prayer appears to be prevalent among some Christians. However, Jesus' disciples were in immensely rewarded when they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. God placed, a prayer, God placed a prayer book, the Psalms, at the heart of the Bible, not simply to show us how God's people, of, excuse me, showed us how God's people of ancient times prayed, but as also to learn how, to, how we to can pray us. today. To teach us how to, we can pray today. From the earliest pages, ages, the Psalms have shaped the prayers of God's people, including Jesus' prayers in first, that is in First Chronicles 16, 7 and 9, Nehemiah 12, 8, Matthew 27, 46, and Ephesians 5, 19. This week we will look at the role of Martha, excuse me, role of Psalms played in the helping of God's people to traverse their life journey and grow in their relationship with God. We should remember that the Psalms are prayers and, as such, are invaluable, not only for their theological insight, but also for the ways they can enrich the, and transform our individual and communal, communal prayers. From the Bible okay. Guide. How do you think people at our church would respond if someone memorized one of these Psalms? Of course, it would depend on which one, and prayed it. Thought about that? You know, Ellen White says that sometimes it would be very profitable if an entire church service would be dedicated to someone reading an important part of Scripture, just reading it. I mean, what did the what did the early churches do when they got a new a new scroll from Paul or something like that? <sighs> That's what they did. That's what they did. Okay, from early times, David and others assigned special men to the work of singing anthems for corporate worship. Those men were almost always chosen from among the Levites, and that's, those are the verses which are mentioned earlier. Is it a good idea to memorize psalms? How many of us have memorized at least one psalm? All of us, in this group, I'm sure. And probably most of us, several psalms. I am sure that we, I mean, one of the things, we learned Psalm 23, and we learned Psalm 19, and, and some others, yeah. It is a good idea, is it a good idea to memorize Psalms, or is that just turning it into rote memory? Is it all right to use a Psalm that you have memorized as a prayer? Well, here's a suggestion, Gary. A simple way of introducing the Psalms into daily life <coughs> is to devote time each day to the reading of a Psalm, beginning with Psalm 1, and following the order given in the Psalter. Another way is to read the Psalms that correspond to your present situation, whatever it happens to be. There are Psalms of lament, the Psalms of communal lament, the thanksgiving, Psalms, hymns, penitential psalms. 
the wisdom psalms in brackets, seeking God's wisdom and guidance, historic psalms, psalms containing anger and rage, and pilgrimage psalms. Over the course of this quarter, we will be looking at many of them and studying these psalms in the context in which they appear. How then are we to read the Psalms? Okay, now let me ask you a question. You see, a few, you biblical scholars, uh, where do we learn, you probably get a, a hint now, where would we learn that the food which was fed to the children of Israel in the desert was angels' food? Don't everybody talk at once. I'm guessing it's from the Psalms. It's from the Psalms. <laughs> and one of the one of the song, one of the more lengthy Psalms, which talks about a whole psalm is that one of the historical psalms that talks about the children of Israel getting out of Egypt and so forth and so forth like that. And that's where it says they were fed angels' food. Now, does that make it true or not true or True. And let me just ask you another trivia question. Remember that originally, when the, they st first started eating manna, a portion of manna was put in a jar and sealed. And was put in the ark. Mm -hmm. Is it still there? Uh, possible. <laughs> okay. Are the Psalms specifically intended to be read and, mem and memorized, or could they have been an even, there had been an even deeper purpose? Jennifer? From Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Now we're jumping all the way over to the New Testament to talk about Psalms in the Old Testament. Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct each other with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. From the Good News translation. So very specific comment about psalms, right? Or songs. You want to take the next one there? Oh, sure. From the Bible study guide. What does it mean to quote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly? Now that's the new King James version of the verse. Mm, from Colossians 3.16. Why is reading the Bible the first and most crucial step for that experience? From the adult study guide from January 7th. Okay. So... I don't have to tell any of you that there were rough times. The children of Israel, we know their story was up and down and up and down and up and down all through the Old Testament. So rough times came on the children of Israel. It seemed at least temporarily that the Israelites were being defeated and once again a plea went up for God to stand by them. Questions were raised about why God was abandoning them when they still prayed to him. And finally, like Daniel in Daniel 9, they essentially said, God, your name is being looked down on because of what is happening to us. Could that be true? What kind of psalms have been read and used and discussed in modern Seventh-day Adventist church services? Are we inclined to use them very often? 23rd Psalm. Fairly often, 23rd Psalm. Psalm 19 is used fairly often. 91. 91. Why not one? What? Number one. Psalm one. Psalm yeah. one, yeah. Are we afraid to use some of the more blunt and accusatory psalms against God? Or would we be better off to pray those prayers as if they were our prayers until we learn to speak more honestly to God? <laughs> mm. Would we dare to follow this advice from the Bible study guide? Dwayne, I think that's yours. First, read the psalm, engaging in simple reflection, and then pray. Ruminating over the psalm involves reflection on the various aspects of the psalm, the way the psalmist addresses God and the reasons for the prayer. Consider how your situation corresponds to the psalmist's experience and how the psalm might be able to help you articulate your experience. You will be amazed at how often you will find yourself being able to resonate and relate to what you read there. If something in the psalm challenges you, ponder, for example, whether the psalm corrects your present false hopes about something you are facing. 
contemplate the psalm's message in the light of Christ's person and salvific work and the long-term hope Christ's work offers us. As we know, or should know, it always helps to look at everything in the Bible in the light of Christ and the cross. Okay, so how do we read the Psalms in light of Christ and the cross? Well, one part of it is real easy. We know how to apply Psalm 22 to the cross, don't we? Because so many of the things mentioned in that Psalm specifically were fulfilled at the cross. At the cross. That's easy. But, I mean, and again, I want you to remember what we talked about in last week's lesson. These were the things that they studied again and again. They were read again and again and again and again. Because they, I mean, the amount of material, written material that they had available, most of them, was very, very limited. I mean, think of, you know, millions of books that we have available, you know. They had the same stuff going over. So these things were imprinted on their brains. And so these were the ideas they were expressed when if something's imprinted in there, what happens? At some point in light time, it's probably going to come out, right? Well, in the first Psalm, he says, and in his law, he meditates day and night. night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember yeah. as being a JMV kid, mm -hmm. way, way back, we were all expected to know the Ten Commandments word yes. for word. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I never forgot that. And Ellen White, I think she got her greatest want of the world is the want of man. That's, that's Psalms chapter one. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, Okay, so as we know, or should know, I said, go ahead. So, who was reading? Oh. Also. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Also look for new motives for the prayer that the psalm supplies and think about their importance for you, your church, and the world. Ask God to put his word on your heart and mind. If the psalm corresponds to the situation of someone you know, intercede in prayer for that person. The point is, the psalms cover so many aspects of life, and we can be enriched by reading and absorbing into our hearts what they are saying to us from the Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Yeah. So how many situations in life are covered by at least some part of one psalm? Well, it's there are not many, many. There's not many situations that, that aren't covered, right? That's part of what we're learning here. And this lesson, we will focus particularly on special times when we should be using psalms for prayers. Four psalms will be our study for this week. Psalm 44, 22, you recognize that one again, mm -hmm. 13, and the first five verses of Psalm 60. So Psalm 44 is a communal prayer written by the sons of Korah. Okay, remember that Korah was one of the most, one of those perpetrators of evil that caused, that rose up against Moses. Korah, along with the families of Dathan and Abiram, was swallowed up by the earth in front of the children of Israel. And what did they say when that happened? Run. <laughs> Run. <laughs> yeah. But Korah's family was preserved, presumably because they were not involved in his rebellion. Psalm 44 was a challenge for the children of Israel to look back over their history and think about God's guidance and protection since the days they left Egypt. Let's look at Psalm 44. We don't have time to read the whole thing. It's quite lengthy, but let's, I'll put part of it up here on the screen. Whose turn is it? The Charles. The effectiveness of Psalms in, in church worship services often reflects the exclusive. You're going to. We need to read here. Oh, it's over there. Can okay. you do that? Or, or How you what? yourself drove out the heathen and established your people in their land. How you punished the other nations and caused your own to prosper. Your people did not conquer the land with their swords. They did not win it by their own power. It was by your power and your strength by the assurance of your presence, with which show, showered the, yeah, which showed. which showed it with your love, that you love them. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay, so and the, the thing, it goes on, and this is amazing stuff. I, I didn't remember having really focused on this psalm before. And he says again and again, just, God, we couldn't do anything without you. Which when you read the history, mm -hmm. you see his presence there. Yeah. Yes. You are my king, my God. You give victory to your people, and by your power we defeat our enemies. I do not trust in my bow or in my sword to save me. I mean, I don't know. This is this a David psalm. I don't know whether it is or not. So let's see what it says up here. The little last... Uh, oh, this is a poem by the clan of Korah. So this is Korah's children mm. again. Mm. Mm. But it, it could... It might as well be David's. Yeah, yeah. I do not trust in my bow and my sword to save me. What do we sometimes say about the children of Israel? Remember, if you read Exodus 23, God's original plan for them to get into the land was to do what? Try. Follow his guidance and let him... And sing their way through into yes, the promised land. Let God drive out their enemies ahead of them. And what did they finally end up doing? We want to do it with our spears and our swords. And what is this saying? We want the king. Someone here recognized mm. if they had done it by their, they tried to do it by their own power, they would have never succeeded. Mm. You've saved us from our enemies and defeated those who hate us. We will always praise you and give thanks to you forever. But now you have rejected us and let us be defeated. You no longer march out with our enemies with our armies, I'm sorry. You made us run from our enemies, and they took for themselves what was ours. You allowed us to be slaughtered like sheep. You scattered uh, us in foreign countries You sold your own people for a small price, as though they had little value. Our neighbors see what you did to us, and they mock us and laugh at us. I mean, what's happening here? This is at a time when they weren't doing so well, right? But it was their choice. I, I've just done First Kings uh, this Not morning. Not arguing <laughs> with you at all. <laughs> and then they have their audacity to tell the Lord, hey, it's your fault. <laughs> Come to think. Okay, let me see here. Make sure I've got, yeah. Psalm 44, what does this psalm say to you? The selectiveness of psalms in church worship services often reflects the exclusiveness of moods and words that we express in our community prayer, communal prayers. We wouldn't dare say, you know, God, why have you abandoned us in church, would we? <laughs> I mean, come on now. Just because Jesus said it. Yeah. <laughs> we can say it about him, but not about us. Such restrictiveness may be a sign of our inability or uneasiness Okay, which one is it for us? Inability or uneasiness? Honestly. To engage the dark realities of life. Though we may sometimes feel that God treats us unfairly when suffering hits us, we do not find it appropriate to express our thoughts in public worship or even in private prayer. Oh no, we wouldn't talk about that. I mean, I think of a story about a friend of mine who was traveling in another part of the world and happened to speak to somebody from a completely different church, Christian church, and they asked that person, uh, what do you think of the book of Revelation? And this person says, oh, we, 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 we never read the book of Revelation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, that happens here too. Oh, I'm sure. Walking buddy, you know. Yeah, I'm just trying to keep it sort of <laughs> remote from us. <laughs> We would never say anything like that, would we? The reluctance could cause us to miss the point of worship. The failure to express honestly and openly our feelings and views before God in prayer often leaves us in bondage to our own emotions. This also denies us confidence and trust in approaching God. Praying the Psalms gives an assurance that when we pray and worship, we are not expected to censure or deny our experience from the Bible study guide. So does the wording of Psalm 44 shock you? Should it? Would you dare to speak very honestly with God if you knew that one of your famous ancestors had been swallowed up along with the families of Dathan and Abiram? <laughs> Hold on just a minute. That could happen to me, right? Consider these lessons as quoted from the Bible study guide, which we can learn from this prayer of the sons of Korah. Jim? The sons of Korah trust in God, Psalms 44, verses 4 to 8. 
no matter what humiliations they face because they remember Yahweh's works for them. Psalms 44, 1 to 3. Their complaint is not one in which hard feelings and recrimination toward God dominate. Rather, their prayer is based on true faith in His strength and mercy. So even though they're complaining that it looks like, it seems like God has abandoned them, do they trust Him? They still believe that God is going to step in, He's going to do something, right? Okay, go ahead. Uh, paragraph 2. They claim the Lord has abandoned them to the mercy of their enemies, Psalms 44, 9 to 16. We can express the same sentiment to our Creator without, can we yeah. express the same sentiment to our Creator without losing our faith? Verse, uh, paragraph three, the sons of Korah confirm they have not forgotten their Psalm, their God in Psalms 44, 17. They have been faithful and acknowledge they cannot cheat the Lord, Psalms 44, 17 to 22. So what, what do they mean by saying you cannot cheat the Lord? God knows everything about us already. You can't, you can't, you know, you don't, you don't have to tell him something in your prayers that he doesn't already know. You can't cheat God. Okay, go ahead. The song ends with cries, excuse me, strong cries for God to act on their behalf. Awake, arise, redeem, Psalms 44, 23 to 26. Thus, they plead mightily for deliverance from the Bible study guide. Okay, so how does that, the, the, the sequence of things there, how does that strike you? I mean, if you were out there with your sword trying to fight a battle, would it be appropriate to sometimes feel like things aren't going too well? Of course. I would. Do innocent people ever suffer? <laughs> if we feel that we are suffering because of some cause beyond our control, is that a valid reason for crying out to God? I mean, let's think about these things. At such times, is it a good idea to look back at times when we felt God was very near? You remember the words from Ellen White? She said, when you can't, it seems like you can't see any light ahead of you, look back to the last place where you saw the light. Look back to the last place where you saw the light. Think about the last situation in which you felt God was in control and that He was working in your life and then move forward from there. Okay, it's, uh, what about Psalm 22? This is a psalm we need to look at in some depth. Who's next? Yes, me. Carrie, yeah. Uh, psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I have cried desperately for help, but still it does not come. During the day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. I call at night, but get no rest. But you are enthroned as the Holy One, the one whom Israel praise, praises. Pray, yeah, I had it right the first time. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted you and you saved them. They called to you and escaped from danger. They trusted you and were not disappointed. But I am no longer a human being. I'm a worm, despised and scorned by everybody. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. Did that part of the psalm, was that part of the psalm quoted by Jesus? It's not recorded that way. No. There was never a reason for him to say, I'm a worm. Yeah. But it's part of this psalm. Okay, go ahead. All who see me jeer at me. They stick out their tongues and shake their heads. He trusted. You relied on the Lord, they say. Why doesn't he save you if the Lord likes you? Why doesn't he help you? It was you who brought me safely through birth. And when I was a baby, you kept me safe. I have relied on you since the day I was born and you have always been my God. Do not stay away from me. Trouble is near, and there is no one to help. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like welted, melted rather, wax. My throat is as dry as dust, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. 
You have left me for dead in the dust. An evil gang is around me. Like a pack of dogs, they close in on me. They tear at my hands and feet. All my bones can be seen. My now head... this sounds a little more like Jesus again, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just my enemies. As I was doing that, what you see on the TV with what's going on in the Middle East there. Yeah. It, even here is that kind of stuff. Like a pack of dogs, they close in. Anyway, I go down. All my bones can be seen. My enemies look at me and stare. They gamble for my clothes and divide them amongst themselves. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, don't stay away from me. Come quickly to my rescue. Save me from the sword and save my life from these dogs. Rescue me from these lions. I am helpless before these wild bulls. I will tell my people what you have done. I will praise you in their assembly. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. Honor him, you descendants of Jacob. Worship him, you people of Israel. He does not neglect the poor or ignore their suffering. He does not turn away from them, but answers them when they call for help. In the full assembly, I will praise you for what you have done in the presence of those who worship you. I will offer the sacrifices I promised. The poor will eat as much as they want. Those who come to the Lord will praise him. They, may they prosper forever. All nations will remember the Lord. From every part of the world, they will turn to him. All races will worship him. The Lord is king and he rules the nations. All proud people will bow down to him. All mortals will bow down before him. Let me interrupt for a second. Does this sound a little different than, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, oh yes. What a change, okay, go ahead. Uh, all Future. proud people will bow down to him. All mortals will bow down before him. Future generations will serve him. They will speak of the Lord to the coming generation. People not yet born will be told. The Lord saved his people, and that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, so when reading Psalm 22, we immediately recognize that these were words which Jesus spoke, at least some of them. And we remember things that happened to him uh, as he was hanging on the cross. He died when the Father, the only source of life, for every human being was separating his beams of light and love from his son, desire of ages 753 and 754. David must have gone through some of these same kinds of experiences. Look at the words that were repeated at the cross. All my bones can be seen. My enemies look at me and stare. They gamble for my clothes and divide them among themselves. Just one of the, one of the verses. You know, there, another way to translate what, what Jesus says, was it in Matthew and is it in Mark? It says, my God, or it, it's, they, they, in parentheses, they say, my God, my God. But he said, Eloi, Eloi, or Eli, Eli, which is referring to Elohim, which means my people, my children. Why have you abandoned me? Well, Elohim is the plural word for God. That's, it's used many different ways. There's yeah. a, at least a, a 10 variations on that word. One I mean, of them refers to Satan. So uh, that is not... <laughs> well, I mean, when, when we say God, we use God with a capital G to mean Yahweh. But we use gods for all kinds of the, other things the just the same way. The translators and the, even the Hebrew writers do not... And then the, and with the New Testament, we have, we're dealing with Greek or, or the, uh, the Aramaic. And so it, it's, it's a really uh, it's distorted and messed up the people's perception, especially when they put a paragraph or a, a, a line explaining something that was is misinformation uh, there. So David must have gone through some of those same kinds of experiences we mentioned. It's important to notice that almost all of the Psalms end with words of rejoicing or praise. Why is that? Remember, Jesus says, You've, uh, you came, I came to you and you didn't recognize me. Yeah. Okay. Well, John said that. Well, but whatever I, it is, he, he's, he's, he's uh, refer, referring to what Jesus had said. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, just a replay right at the end of Jesus' life 
that he was saying, my children, my people, why have you abandoned me? Yeah. He's not talking to, to his father. He, of course he's talking to his father. I say no, you say yes, and we need to research it a little bit more carefully. Okay. Okay, who's next? Um, so it's from the Bible Study Guide. Praying the Psalms thus takes worshipers to new spiritual horizons. The Psalms let worshipers express their feelings and understandings, but they are not left where they presently are. The worshipers are led to abandon their burdens of pain, disappointment, anger, and despair before God, and to trust in Him, whatever their circumstances. The movement from lament to praise observed in many psalms is suggestive of the spiritual transformation that the believers experience when they receive divine grace and comfort in prayer. How can we learn to see beyond our immediate trials and thus trust in God's goodness, whatever we face now? From the Bible Study Guide, January 9th. Okay, well, as Christians, when we begin to read Psalm 22, our thoughts go immediately to Jesus on the cross. This psalm originally was a personal petition from King David. He apparently was being pursued either by Saul shortly before Saul's death or possibly at the time of the rebellion of his son Ab Absalom. Consider these expressions for Psalms 22 as listed in the Bible study guide. So look at these particular uh, expressions and, and what they, how they were used and so forth. Jim? Actually, I think that's a I'm sorry, Dwayne? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's, of course, a direct quote from Psalm 22, but it's quoted several places in the New Testament. Go ahead. Psalm 22, 7 is applied to Jesus on the cross and to his mockers. From Mark 15, 29 and Matthew 27. Psalm 22, 16, my hands and feet have shriveled is a direct allusion to Jesus being nailed to the cross, even though this particular verse is not quoted by the Gospels. Mark, uh, 15, Matthew, Mark 15, 24 and Matthew 27, 35 allude to Psalm 22, 18. Psalm 22, 12 to 15 also can be applied without any hesitation to the experience of Jesus. Psalm 22:17 depicts the condition of our Savior on the cross. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. Now, do we, what do we know about the bones of Jesus? They were not broken, not one. Not one, okay. How inspiring to know that Jesus himself lamented in the midst of his suffering and expressed his anguish to his heavenly Father. There is no sin in such an expression of raw honesty. Jesus even requested in the Garden of Gethsemane, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, reminding us that the genuine expression in prayer of our feelings and weaknesses is never an offense to God's ears. After Jesus poured out his feelings of his heart to his Father, he ended his prayer with perfect submission to his Father's will. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Okay, so the example of Jesus gives us some pretty challenging standards, doesn't it? Have you ever wondered how you could explain to your children why some disasters happen? What do you say to your, if you have young children, Jennifer, what do you say to your children about what's happening in the Middle East right now? Not much, I would guess. <laughs> okay. Psalm, Psalm 13. 13. How much longer will you forget me, Lord, forever? Did you ever pray like that? Mm -hmm. I haven't. How much longer will you hide yourself from me? How long must I endure trouble? How long will sorrow fill my heart day and night? How long will my, my enemies triumph over me? Look at me, O Lord, my God, and answer me. Restore my strength. Don't let me die. Don't let my enemies say, we have defeated him. Don't let them gloat over my downfall. I rely on your constant love. I will be glad because you will rescue me. I will sing to the Lord, O God, because you have been good to me from the Good News Bible. 
Okay, Psalm 13 then points to the way to avoid another common mistake, focusing on ourselves and our problems when praying. This psalm can, be transform, can transform our prayer by leading us to reaffirm the faithful and unchanging nature of God's dealings with his people. Sure, though the psalm does begin with laments and complaints, it does not end there. And that's the crucial point. The psalm leads us to deliberately choose to trust God's redemptive power. And, I mean, really, I guess what we could say right at this point in time, we know how it's going to end. We may not be there. We may all die. We may, who knows, you know, maybe there's a Chinese bomb headed for us right now. We don't know. See, we don't know, don't know those things. But what we do know is that God is going to triumph in the end. Okay? And so that our fear and anxiety, Psalm 13, 1 to 4, can gradually give way to God's salvation. And we begin experiencing change from lament to praise, from despair to hope. However, a mere repetition of the words of the Psalms with only a slight comprehension of their meaning will not produce the authentic transformation intended by their use. When praying the Psalms, we should seek the Holy Spirit to enable us to act in the way, we, way demanded by the Psalm. I mean, do we, would we dare to pray some psalms that sound pretty horrific? The psalms are the word of God by which believers' characters and actions are transformed, not simply informed. Let me read that again. The psalms are the word of God by which believers' characters are, and actions are transformed, not simply informed. We don't just read it to learn something. By God's grace, the promises of the Psalms are made manifest in the lives of believers. This means that we allow God's word to shape us according to God's will and to unite us with Christ, who demonstrated God's will perfectly and as the incarnate Son of God prayed the Psalms as well. It's, it's interesting if you think, okay, I'm praying this prayer. This was a prayer that Jesus himself prayed. When we, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, that wasn't really his prayer, but it was a prayer that he gave to us. So in a sense, it is his prayer that he gave to us. Psalm 13 raises two major questions that certainly must have been voiced, maybe just subconsciously, by each of us at difficult times in our lives. The first question is, why? And the second question is, how long? Okay. The writers of the Psalter list two questions to express desperation amid suffering and trials. The question is why? Hebrew lama? Yeah. Why? It's used when the interlocutor that wants... One, that one's the, the, the speaker. Okay wants to understand the action of God under difficult circumstances as follows. Number one, when it seems the Lord is not doing anything to save his uh, followers. Psalms 10, 1, Psalms 44 to 23. Number two, when it seems that God has forsaken the sufferer. Psalms 20 to 1, Psalms 40 to 9, Psalms 44, 24. Or number three, when it appears that the Lord has cast him off. Wow. 42, 3, Psalms 74, 1, Psalms 88, 14. In a sense, this question is employed in the attempt to understand the reason for the action or inaction of God. So what, what's it saying? This person is trying to figure out, okay, why is God doing this or why is he not doing this? He says, God, help me to understand what's going on here. Okay. The second question the psalmist uses is how long? Psalms 13, 1 to Psalms 35, a lot of them. 17. Okay. A lot of them, yes. How long is utterly dissimilar to why in its int intention? How long doesn't dis dispute God's action in the midst of one's suffering. Rather, how long acknowledges the Lord is always in control. Further, 
this question does not petition God for vengeance against the source of one's pain and sorrow. Now, let me interrupt for a second. So, if you are asking how long, you are you're implying that God is in charge. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You are you're, you're implying that God is in charge. He can allow it to persist, the problem, whatever it is, or it can bring it to an end. Right. So, this is not why, this is how long. Okay. Well, just like uh, the souls under the mercy seat. Yeah. How long? Psalm, I mean, Revelation 5. There you are. And uh, it's, it's okay to ask that, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. Uh, this interrogative expression simply voices the desire to know how much longer God will require the believer to wait. Moreover, how long requests the Lord to act. This question also embodies the feeling of spiritual fatigue we endure in the face of our ongoing suffering and the yearning for it to end. Yeah. We too want with the psalmist may ask the Lord in our behalf, in our prayers, yes. how long? Likewise, we may submit to Him and petition for His intervention and mercy such a plea can be termed an grievance of faith. Grievance of faith, wow. <laughs> After his painful complaint, David moves to his petition. This uh, transition <coughs> models for us an important principle in our own prayers. We must not stagnate or wallow in our regrets, rather, we should move toward, forward in faith. Consider, the, uh, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes. Uh -huh. Help me see. Yeah. Uh, times what we really need is the assurance that the Creator is with us. Right. Yeah. When you say how long, you're implying that God's in charge, but Sometimes it, you can't be, you just don't feel so sure. So what you're really saying is, God, show me that you are in charge here, that you're in control. How long do I need to wait? Well, Psalm 60, 1 to 5. Look at another passage that we're supposed to study. You have rejected us, God. You have rejected us, God, and defeated us. You have been angry with us, but now turn back to us. You have made the land tremble and you have cut it open. Now heal its wounds because it is, fail it is falling apart. You have made your people suffer greatly. We stagger around as though we were drunk. You have warned those who show you reverence. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You have warned those who show you reverence so that they might escape destruction. Save us by your might. Answer our prayer so that the people you love may be rescued. But, but, but wait, when you read the history of Israel, at least in the scriptures, some of this don't apply. Yeah, at certain times. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we don't know. We don't know exactly what the conditions were in which this was written. That's true. That's um, there. Right. We could look over and see if it gives, you know, the little things that are written at the top of these things, we know that they're, you know, hold on here. Let's just see what it says here. A Psalm of David, mm. it says, for teaching when he fought against the Arameans from Nehaner, Neharim and from Zobah and, Juba, and Joab turned back and killed 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Wow. So that's what they believe. Now, what about those little descriptions? What do we know about them? Guesses. <laughs> well, what we know about let's 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 talk about what we really know. And and Jim is partly right. What we really know is they have been there for a long time. If they were guesses, they were guesses by somebody. If they're not by the original author, at least they were by somebody long, long, long ago. That. Uh, put those things there. Possibly Ezra or his ilk. It, that's a possibility. And the question would be, if it was Ezra, who lived many uh, hundreds of years after many of these things happened, was he inspired in putting those things there? He was a priest and not a prophet. He was a prophet too. No. 
Do you ever feel like praying words like those? Okay. Psalms of lament are generally understood as prayers of people living through trying times. Okay. Whether physical, psychological, or spiritual, or all three. Okay. Physical, psychological, or spiritual, all three. However, this does not mean that we should avoid these psalms, even in good times. Sometimes there may be a total disjunction between the words of the psalm and the worshippers present experience. That is, Psalms of Lament can be beneficial to worshipers who are not in distress. Now, why would that be? Why would it be? Well, I, I guess the real question is, we're studying it right now, aren't we? And yet it's a, apparently was written by somebody in a very difficult situation. So is it a benefit to us right now? Yeah, it helps us to understand, you know, you don't have to wait till you get into a situation to start reading about that. You can <laughs> learn about it in advance. So sometimes there may be a total disjunction between the words and so forth and the psalmist and the worshiper's present experience. That is, psalms of lament can be beneficial to worshipers who are not in distress. First, they can make us more aware that suffering is part of, excuse me, part of the general human experience. Guess what? And that it happens to both the righteous and the wicked. The Psalms assure us that God is in control and provides strength and solutions in times of trouble. Even in this Psalm, even amid the tr trouble, you have made the earth tremble, the, the writer writes. The Psalmist displays his ultimate hope in God's deliverance. Second, the lament Psalm, Psalms teach us, and we just, we, just, we just looked at one lament Psalms, there's a lot of them. The so lament Psalms teach us compassion toward the sufferers. When expressing our happiness and gratitude to God, especially in public, we must be mindful of the less fortunate. I mean, the person standing next to you might be in dire straits right at that moment. Sure, we might have things go uh, good right now, but who doesn't know of people all around us who are suffering terribly? Praying such psalms can help us not forget those who are going through tough times, the Psalms should revoke uh, in us compassion and a desire to minister to the suffering as Jesus did from our Bible study guide. Uh, okay, Jim from Ellen White. The world is a vast laser house, but Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He, had, excuse me, he was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves. Yet he did not refuse to heal them. Let me interrupt for just a second. Who were the first ones that we know about in the Bible to proclaim that Jesus was Christ? Was it the demoniacs? The demoniacs. <laughs> uh, yeah. Lake Genesaret when the cross. And there are others. They they weren't the only ones. There are other demoniacs that yeah. say, leave us alone, God. Why? Alone. Our time uh, has not come yet. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And when the when virtue from Christ entered into those poor souls, they were conf convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their physical maladies. Let me interrupt for again, for real quickly. What was their understanding of disease back in those days? Someone, your father's forefathers. Either you sinned or your parents sinned, and now that's why you're suffering. So what do you have to do? You have to forgive the sin before you can heal the disease. Even that, the disciples believe that. Yeah, even the disciples believe that. That was, that was their attitude. So you see how that fits here. I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. The gospel still possesses the same power, and why should we not today witness the same results? Another way of saying gospel is the good message, or the message that can make, help make you good. Yeah, well, the good news about God, too. Well, the, but yeah. the truth, Jesus came to show what the truth is. Yeah. He didn't come to pay penalties of sin yeah. Nobody, nobody learns if somebody pales a ba bails you out. Yeah. 
In our understanding Psalm 60, we, we need to have, in our understanding of Psalm 60, we need to read 2 Samuel 8, 1 to 14. Carrie? Sometime later, King David attacked the Philistines again, defeated them, and ended their control over the land. Then he defeated the Moabites. Now let me interrupt for a second here. I'm sorry, I interrupt too many interruptions. What relationship was there between David and the Moabites? Well, um, Moabites Mom, were the kids Ruth of was his grandmother? Great-grandmother. Great -grandmother. Great, his great-grandmother was a Moabite. Moabite. Not only that, when he was running away from Saul, he went over and the Moabites protected him for quite some time. So now he's, look what he did. Go ahead. He made the prisoners lie down on the ground and put two out of every three of them to death. Lie down? Okay, I'm going to kill you and you. Okay, you can live. I'm going to kill you and you, and you can live. That sounds like something very current, doesn't it? Somehow. Yes. Why, why did, when Jesus was here, why didn't he re, uh, uh, recount that story? And, and uh, so that we can learn to be more like Jesus if he was the, <laughs> the killer of God of the Old Testament. It, 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 that this mind being you is, is in Christ Jesus. Why didn't he ta ta teach us how to do the killing? Yeah. Okay, go so ahead. The Moabites became his subjects and paid taxes to him. Then he defeated the king of Syrian state, Zobah, Hadadiza's son of Rehob, as Adadiza was on his way to restore his control over the territory by the upper Euphrates. I'm going to stop and ask you a question here. Keep watching the clock. If David, David is controlling the area all the way down basically to Egypt, and now he has just conquered somebody who's responsible for upper Euphrates, how much of the Middle East is he controlling? Pretty much. A chunk of it there. Yeah. Most of it. Right. And that's what was prophesied by Moses in Moses' day, wasn't it? From Egypt to, Egypt to the Euphrates. Okay, so here it is being fulfilled. That is the only time. I yeah. can think. Once yeah. we was gone, that was the yeah. end. David captured 1,700 of his horsemen and 20,000 of his foot soldiers. He kept enough horses for a hundred chariots and crippled all the rest. When the Syrians Damas of Damascus rather sent an army to help King Hadadezer, David attacked it and killed 22,000 men. Then he set up military camps in their territory and they became his subjects and paid taxes to him. The Lord made David victorious everywhere. David captures the gold uh, captured the, the gold shields carried by Abadez's officials and took them to Jerusalem. He also took a great quantity of bronze from the Betar and Barothel cities ruled by Hadadezer. David became even more famous when he returned from killing 18,000 rather Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He <coughs> set up military camps throughout Edom, and the people there became his subjects. The Lord made David victorious everywhere. Okay. Boy, oh how many, have you added up how many people he killed? Oh, no. No. <laughs> well, 50,000 right there, or 40. Well, huh? I was just going to say, when you think of how they did it, as, yeah. as, against what we have with machine guns and stuff, they're still running circles around us. Hmm. The way it seems to go. Well, God certainly blessed David despite his faults and his sins. Psalm 60, verses 1 to 5, which we read, is a promise that God will always be with us. How many people do you know that need your prayers right now? Might they also need a helpful hand or a ministering touch? Hmm. Psalm 42, verse 8. Jennifer? May the Lord show his constant love during the day so that I may have a song at night a prayer to the God of my life from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> okay, that's interesting. May the Lord show his constant love. I mean, if you're fighting enemies all day long and you can, you can go home and sing at night, that's, that's, <laughs> that's quite a... Two very powerful Psalms, Psalm 32 and 51, were written by David after his sin with Bathsheba and arranging for the death of Uriah the Hittite. Ellen White has some very powerful words about those psalms. 
Dwayne. The, con the confession was forced from his guilty soul by an awful sense of condemnation and a fearful looking for of judgment. The consequences that were to result to him filled him with terror, but there was no deep, heartbreaking grief in his soul that he had betrayed the spotless Son of God and denied the Holy One of Israel. Pharaoh, when suffering under the judgments of God, acknowledged his sin in order to escape further punishment. He returned to his defiance of heaven as soon as the plagues were stayed. These all lamented the results of sin, but did not sorrow for the sin itself. Okay, now there's a little break, and now we're going to look up the conclusion to this. Go ahead. The prayer of David after his fall illustrates the nature of true sorrow for sin. His repentance was sincere and deep. There was no effort to palliate his guilt. No desire to escape the judgment threatened inspired his prayer. David saw the enormity of his transgression. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. It was not for pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart. He longed for the joy of holiness, to be restored to harmony and communion with God. This was the language of his soul. And what are the famous words that we quote, we learn from Psalm 51? Create a clean me a new heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Okay, okay. go ahead. A repentance such as this is beyond the reach of our own power to accomplish. It is obtained only from Christ, who ascended up on high and has given gifts unto men. Now, how quickly we say it's obtained only from Christ? It's obtained only for Christ because it's only by following his example that we can do such a thing. How many Psalms have you memorized? Would it be a good idea to put a number of Psalms of different types into one's memory? If we did that, would we learn to be more bold in our language with God? That's what the people that did in New Testament times. They memorized these things, and so that's the words they, they thought about. The psalmist expressed hope, courage, boldness, even persistence. And we're running out of time, so we'll conclude there. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we read these challenging ideas from the book of Psalms, some who, which seem almost wrong to us, Help us to understand how we are to understand them and how they to help us in learning how to pray is our prayer in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen.